All right, with ChatGPT taking the world by storm, the spotlight on artificial intelligence is brighter than ever before. What exactly is the scope of AI and what are the implications that lie ahead? Here to discuss is Eric Brynjolfsson, Stanford Digital Economy Lab Director. Good morning to you. Before we even get too morning. deep uh, or down this rabbit hole, what is the difference, you know, what is making this crop of AI different than in years past? And, and how does it compare to, let's say, even an, an algorithm? I think there's a lot of confusion out there. Sure. Sure. Well, ChatGPT is an example of a, of a new class of AI that is, I think, a really big breakthrough. It's, uh, these are called foundation models. They include not only the large language models that can write stories, poetry, email, ads, many other types of text, but you, many of you have probably played with DALI that make images, others that make videos, audio, even write computer code. Um, these tools are having a set of implications that I think are bigger than even their developers expected initially. Uh, trillions of dollars of value will be created. And, and Eric, you've written about, um, you know, there's been a lot made of, and a lot of, I think, fear out there, as well as excitement over what these new developments can mean. You've written about um, what you call the Turing trap, one of the potential right. um, things that we need to watch out for. Can you explain that to people? Sure. Um, well, what, you know, Alan Turing famously proposed that the test for intelligence was what he called, what we, we later called the Turing test, which was how similar can an AI be to a human? And uh, trying to mimic humans has been kind of a goal of a lot of computer scientists ever since. You know, can we fool humans to, so you can't tell the difference? I think it's a very evocative goal, but it's also a trap. And the reason it's a trap is that if we make AI that mimics humans, uh, it actually destroys the value of human labor and it leads to more concentration of wealth and power. But there's an alternative approach, which is making AI that augments humans, that allows us to do new things we never did before. Don't try to mimic us, but try to extend our capabilities. AI that does that is more likely to lead to a flourishing of wealth and more widely shared prosperity. So where the industry is going now, which of these things is the goal? Um, in other words, do you think that, that some of the goals are sort of on the wrong path right now? They sometimes are, although I'm actually pretty optimistic. I've seen lots of good uses of these tools to even enhance inv invention and innovation. People are using them to uh, in invent new compounds. Um, I was talking to a, a, a colleague and, and uh, his, uh, one of his grad students had written up a pr research proposal and he couldn't quite make sense of it. And then he ran it through ChatGPT and he said, ah, that's what she was trying to say. And he showed it to her and said, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. I think there's a lot of people who have some brilliant ideas, they have trouble expressing them, and these tools can be used to help make it more possible for others to, to get what they're trying to say. Eric, we were talking uh, about today uh, a, the new Pixel phone, the, the Super Bowl ad, where you, the magic eraser, where you can erase somebody or an object from a photo. Is that is that tech for good? And, and what is the societal impact of, of something like that? I, I'm really worried, not just about that, but more broadly, deep fakes. Um, just over the weekend, I saw the first uh, deep fake in the wild. There was an ad uh, running on Tic Tac where the, uh, fa some famous uh, people were saying things that they didn't really say. And it's, it was impossible to tell the difference. So this is going to proliferate as the cost of making deep fakes goes down. The number of them is going to increase exponentially. And we're going to have to come up with some ways of, of understanding what's real and what's not real. This all seems to be moving so fast. I wonder if, um, you know, that a lot of that stuff is going to fall through the cracks. In other words, like you say that we have to sort of be prepared for deep fakes. It doesn't feel like we're prepared for deep fakes. No, it doesn't I, feel I, like we're prepared for some of the other pitfalls you're talking about. I, I totally share your concern. The technology is racing ahead and, and the next 10 years could be some of the best 10 years we've ever had or some of the worst, um, but we have to adapt our institutions. One of the reasons I started the Digital Economy Lab here at Stanford was to try to close that gap to study the economic implications, the societal implications, and we need to hustle to catch up. I'm proud of my colleagues, my very smart colleagues that are inventing these amazing technologies, um, but the rest of us in business and economics and social sciences uh, need to get on the ball and think about how we can make sure our society is ready for these changes. Um, if we do it right, I do think that we're gonna have unprecedented productivity and growth, and we can have shared prosperity, but it's far from inevitable. Eric, I think investor, uh, investors have just sent a lot of these AI stocks through the roof. You know, If they bought one of these stocks, uh, let's say a, a C3 AI, if they bought one of these stocks because of announcement of, of AI, how does AI you know, impact their bottom line? Is it, is it 
a one-time shot? Is it, is it a jolt or is it just over time these companies will just see a, just a faster rate of earnings because of AI? Well, we're in real, very early days. I mean, there's been a one-time shock, but then there's going to be another one-time shock and more and more shocks coming in the pipeline. I already know that there are new versions of these large language models that are set to be released shortly uh, that are dramatically better even than the ones we've already seen. They're being used in lots of other applications. So we're like in the first inning of this, and the winners right now may or may not be able to extend their lead. It may be that a whole different set are going to emerge. I see a lot of turbulence. Now, I know you're not coming at it from an investment perspective, but I do wonder, you know, for lay people out there who are buying up AI stocks right now, is there any kind of lens that they can apply or analysis they can apply without being super steeped in it to know who are going to be the winners and losers in this thing? You know, ironically, I think it's almost easier to see the losers than the winners. A, a lot of legacy companies that were relying on uh, just the old way of doing things, their value is going to be threatened. Uh, some of the, the movie studios or others that have uh, amazing content creation capabilities, they're now going to become uh, stranded because we can do it much more cheaply and do them in, in new sorts of ways. Um, it's a good bet to, to focus on companies that have some of the best talent and have some of the best resources. Uh, here, within a few miles of my house here at Stanford, uh, there are, are dozens or hundreds of companies uh, that are tapping into this. And uh, I see a number of years of very fast innovation in this field. Exciting times indeed. Eric Brynjolfsson, Stanford Digital Economy Lab Director. Good to see you. Appreciate it.